Everybody, welcome to Jcast, where there's games, guests, and one guy with a set of headphones today because technical difficulties and everything else that occurs, I cannot get Yeti Hyrule to come and join us today. Today, I am joined. This is a new one for the Jcast world. This is uh, today. I'm joined by Winston A. Abolos. I hope I didn't biff your last name. And his. <laughs> you did, and, but it's all right. I apologize. How do how do you say it? Let me just make sure. Abolos. Abolos. That looked a lot. That sounds a lot cooler for the record. And then with his oh, production yeah, crew, which if I remember correctly, I'm still getting used to the names here. Um, actually, uh, if you could name, who is Shane? Shane Sabella? Okay. And then Tim Aslan? Okay. And Kovar McClure. Okay, so basically you guys are left to right. Perfect. My notes are perfectly aligned with this. I like that. Perfect. This is going to work well today then. Anyway, guys, welcome to the podcast today. It is wonderful to see you guys to join today. I am excited as can be. You guys are the most famous YouTubers, or if you would like to call it, filmmakers, uh, that I've had before. So, round of applause to you guys as I hit my microphone. Round of applause to you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Calm it down, audience. Calm it down. Calm it down. Calm it down. Anyway. FYI, our screen is like, it says split screen broadcaster. What's that? What's that? We can't see you. We can't see you again. Right, right, right. Yeah, right, the right, exploit right. broadcaster thing shows up when I go live, but hopefully that doesn't hopefully impede. That it just it just, it just impedes on my face. I don't make too many expressions, so we'll be focused on you guys. To, we'll be focused on you guys today. Anyway, as anyway. I was saying, so um, first of all, to talk about with Mr. Evelos, uh, he was the director of the short film Alchemy. Now, I have been looking everywhere online to try to find and watch this movie, but apparently, according to what I understand, that you send this to multiple film festivals and got multiple amounts of winnings and nominations, if I remember correctly. Let's see. You sent your short film in Los Angeles to the Awareness Fest, uh, to LA Shorts Fest, Marbella International Film Festival, Holly Shorts Film Festival, and Illuminate Film Festival. And you won the Grand Jury Prize for the Awareness Film Festival. You were most creative music video for World Music and Independent Film Festival. You were the winner for the Best Makeup Artist in World Music and Independent Film Festival. And you were the winner for the Audience Award on Holly Shorts. Can you explain a little bit to me about what exactly developed in this movie? A movie, short film. <laughs> I'm impressed. I don't know how you got all this information, but that's I, impressive. I, I'm going to say four letters. I M D B dot com, I guess. <laughs> wow, I didn't know it was all of that. Also, also, oh, there's that? someone there's someone that uploaded your trailer. I don't think it was originally you, but there's someone that uploaded your trailer and mentioned all of this down in the section for it, and that's where I've gathered information from. If I can find it, then it was a hard find to uh, somehow discover, but when I discovered it, I was like, oh, write this down, Microsoft Word, let's go. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, you guys got a lot of cool rewards with this, and from what I saw in the trailer, it seemed like a pretty cool thing. Now, again, I have not watched it, and I would actually like to encourage the audience to watch it because, I mean, if it gets this many awards, I feel like it should be recognized. What exactly was Alchemy about? Uh, Alchemy was actually my first short, the first short film that I directed. And I tell the story of my life in those six minutes. And I tell the, uh, the story through the song of the killers, all the things that I've done. Huh. huh. So it's a personal journey of my life from being a kid to my 30s and all these like tra personal transformations I've got, had to go through in order to kind of like uh, put myself together. Okay. And that's why I call it alchemy and that's what the film is about. And, hmm. you know, it's, uh, one major component to it is when my dad passed away and it was one major reason why I wanted to tell the story to touch other people's lives with my story. 
because when I was able to <clears throat> look at my life in terms of you know, not all these things that I want to avoid not dealing with or are still shameful about, but how I've come up, you know, how I came, how I overcame, and if that, if, and if I could share that part of my story with other people, mm -hmm. um, it became kind of like the, the inspiration to make films, the inspiration, and, and then the inspiration to make alchemy. So it, it kind of like goes hand in hand with like my mission statement per se of like, um, what I've learned, I want to pass on to other people. That is, that is pretty awesome, and I'd like to watch that for sure. <laughs> um, that's that's definitely awesome. <laughs> you I, totally deserve it with all that work you did. All right, I I got points today. All right, good. From a professional, I I call you a professional filmmaker. You can say if that is or not. I consider it just because I've seen your work. Um, speaking of work, let's talk about since we have the rest of the group here today. Uh, welcome to the cast of and also writers and producers and everything else of Devil's Couriers. If you don't know what Devil's Couriers is, basically, what is it? It's a Son of Anarchy parody with a twist of, what is it again? It's a, it's a twist of something. Humor of uh, workaholics. There we go. Yeah, it was it was very funny. Um, my co-host was watching like four or five episodes of it from the first season, and he was just laughing at every single one. He's just like, every time you walk in, it's like, you know what's going to happen. You're sitting there. You're like, okay, it's going to be interrogation. Okay, you're going to sit there. Nothing's going to happen special. And then all of a sudden, this dude just freaks out about something random. Um, I wish I could remember the episode that I was watching. <laughs> Oh man, I I need to provide more information. I need to provide more information. I haven't watched one for it yet, but there was one of them. This is this is a fan inner fan of me talking. There's one of them that I watched that. Hi, oh, why can't I remember now? Oh man, but anyway, there is a section of it that was really really fun. But um, what what got you guys together? And any one of you can speak about this. What exactly got you guys together and said? We want to make this series called Devil's Couriers, and this is how we're going to establish it. This is how we're going to get the cast and crew. Like, who? First of all, who was the person that got it all together, or was it a collective thing? Uh, I guess it was primarily my idea uh, from the beginning. Uh, just watching Sons of Anarchy one night, I thought it would be funny to uh, write a comedy version mm -hmm. of a motorcycle gang. <laughs> uh, it just seems like a limitless amount of uh, comedy to write guys that want to be tough and cool and uh, just fall on their face constantly <laughs> trying to uh, trying to mimic the uh, <laughs> the motorcycle club world now no. do you do any other productions outside of um, what you have currently for the uh, devil's couriers or do you just currently just do the YouTube channel uh, together uh, we, we started with a, with a series uh, Tim and I had wrote called taking a shot and that's kind of how we all got together Okay. Uh, Kovar okay. was in that show, and then Winston uh, was was helping produce that show uh, for the the second part of it. Okay. And okay. from that, it was uh, more like an odd couple, simple sitcom looking show. Okay. And uh, okay. we decided to kind of broaden out and do more of an action comedy, which I think is more in our our wheelhouse. Okay. And this thing okay. just got bigger and bigger, and uh, this is pretty much our full time gig at this point as we go towards the season mm -hmm. two yeah yeah do you so you, i so, saw you had indie go go yeah. going so is so, this something this that so, how many episodes approximately you're planning for the next season for uh devil's couriers it's gonna be season one is 20 episodes and then we have the interrogations which you mentioned earlier which is what we consider season 1.5 okay so for season two the actual season will be 20 episodes again and then we'll go into a season 2.5, which is uh, additional content. Uh, so it'll roughly be about 30 episodes. And then we're going to try and film a lot of behind the scenes episodes. As I we was just these. about to say, that is an extremely creative idea to have a 2.5. So that, like, if you have additional footage and you just didn't want to put it in like the actual professional production, but it's like something that you thought that was still cool and you put it off to the side as another thing. I think that's a cool idea because there's like the section of behind the scenes, like, uh, and that's my criticism, like as – you know, when people go through a lot of filmmaking and stuff and, you know, you see the movies that have like, oh, it's got behind the scenes. Like you went through like two minutes of the whole like how many day production of this, you know, <laughs> it's like I, you edited it down to two minutes of it. It's like, you know, if you had James Cameron in it and James Cameron decided to read Harry Potter in the middle of it and you don't have that showing. I'm like, OK, this is not behind the scenes, <laughs> you know. This is like, oh, oh, it's just you get the you get like the cast production guy that's just like sitting there on his chair and he's just like. Oh, hey, what's up? 
You got a camera? You got your iPhone out for this? Okay. Yep. Behind the scenes. You're hired. Yeah, I think for season two, we're actually going to focus on that a lot more and actually have a crew dedicated just to behind the scenes for the how, weeks that we're how, shooting. How many, how many are there of all of you, of meaning of that you. Make, make Devil's Curious? There's you four, you, four, you know, as the writers, producers, directors, right. and stuff, but where uh, actors-wise, actors stuff like that, that what total what are you total looking, total looking at for people? people? I want to say season one, I mean, on our biggest days, we go with 30 people 30, on yeah. set. That's mm -hmm. my number. Mm -hmm. Do you rent or is this your own, uh, like, is this like somewhere you just film at a regular house or something like that? Uh, it's all, all rented locations. Okay. And, and, and borrowing some houses. A lot of borrowing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. It's every, I mean, we kind of went gorilla in Palmdale too. Yeah. Some of those like motorcycle shots. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I don't mean to brag, yeah, but uh, I had to borrow a couple people's houses for the thing that I made a while back, you know, for no, for my winter, for my I homecoming winter. thing. <laughs> That's about my best credibility for uh, for filmmaking there. And even then, it was still like, what, what grade are you in? Like fifth? <laughs> But, um, yeah, that's very cool to see you guys that launched so far. And it's, it's cool because I, I appreciate, you know, Winston replying back to, to that. Because, I mean, I'm not kidding you. I, when I sent that message to you, I thought there's no way that he, like, cares. And you're like, I'd be honored to do it. I'm like, I'm like, here's me next to the ground. There's you. Like, if by numbers, at least, you're, like, way above me. I'm like, okay, this, this is a compliment. <laughs> so, more or less... If you want to answer it, go ahead. If you don't, doesn't matter for any one of you guys. Um, is there a specific director in the filmmaking industry today that you are continually inspired by? Like you try to follow your work, not necessarily in the same footsteps, but you you follow the passion that he has. I guess I could say. I, I'm getting thought provoked. Apparently, I, I'm always driven by the story and what the story wants to tell me. Okay. Like I'm driven by story, and, and the story inspires the visuals. I don't know if I have necessarily a director in mind, but I would say, for instance, Ava, uh, she just did Selma. I have an idea for a short film, and she did a film, I think it was her who did Fruitville Station. Did she do Fruitville Station? I don't know. So I might use a, a certain uh, parts of that film too that kind of inspired me, like, oh, I think I want to, you know, use this kind of like... Kind of opens the, op the idea box, the idea. I guess you want to say, right? Yeah. Okay. Kind of gives me the to be able to insert my short film. Oh into yeah. It. Oh yeah. I love I, I love, love when I, that happens. That's always a nice thing cuz you it, sometimes you get on the mental blocks and you take it from someone else, but in retrospect, with us being in the industry for so long, I don't know why I said us, but <laughs> with <laughs> with with um with filmmaking being the way that it's been for so many years, you know, like eventually ideas will have to get reused. And honestly, that's not a bad thing, but just don't remake it. Um, I wanted to actually talk about this fun little topic here. Um, now, obviously, with you guys being filmmakers and stuff, I thought this would be a fun little topic. Um, I don't know. Were you guys strict followers on Sony's uh, production of the interview and what exactly had happened to them due to North Korea's efforts? Did anybody follow that in particular here? I, yeah, yeah, I followed the news, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was hilarious to read about online. Like I saw, I read about maybe eight articles. There's a podcast I did a while back talking about it, and I just wanted to share that with you guys. What did you think when they republished it? Even though North Korea basically threatened to throw out the rest of their information about it, what do you think? If you were in those shoes, would you have done? We're in the shoes of Sony. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you were like the you head person like of Sony, and Kim Jong Un went up to you and said, "I will take." <laughs> Your personal emails talking about how bad James Cameron is, and I will send them viral. <laughs> what? I, what? What do you do? I wonder if that was the. I'm, I'm not sh from everything I read. I don't know if that was the problem. I really think it was. I don't know if that was, was that the problem. Or did you I thought the problem was the security of each theater, and they thought being blown up. They, me, they thought that me, they were going to be live. Basically, basically I, luckily I've read enough of this that so I can explain this to you. Basically, this is what had happened. Um, you maybe want to turn on the TV a little bit because it's getting a little bit of a reverb again. Um, but anyway, basically, this is what had occurred. So, Sony first got hacked in November, and November they lost terabytes on terabytes of information. This was anything from medical records to simple things like, again, emails that I was talking about, like how he's making fun of this person or making fun of that person, you know, whatever it be, uh, to financial statements to, you know, basically, you know, who did the taxes for what. Just in general, it was just financial documents. It's basically 
not their core person of IUs, but it was enough to basically say, if we release this, you're not, you're kind of screwed, you know? And I'm right. and like, this had like social security numbers of a ton of different employees. This had medical records of like, and I think it had some medical records of some other people's some families other that work for Sony. So right. in a nutshell, basically they had everybody on lockdown for this and they freaked out about it. And they initially had wanted to pull the interview because their threat was, if you dare let any anything get leaked about this, if you put this on the internet, if you put this in films, if you put this in, you know, screen places, like for example, if a major cinema production wanted to put it in their theaters, they would say, oh, well, we'll just hack you. Yeah, so that's what that was. And yeah, in a nutshell, they pulled it. And what I found funny is Obama, <laughs> of all things, this was awesome. This was awesome. Obama, basically Obama basically called them pansies called them and pansies told them to put it back up. Yeah. In a nutshell. That. that was yeah, funny because they just said, well, you're going to let a third party, third world, third world country control what you censor. I'm like, well, see, here's them. You can't see my hands, but here's them. Here's us. Just think of a banana and a pea. That's the size I just made difference, I guess. And it's like, well, look, it's I, us, that's them. They tried launching a nuclear missile at us how long ago and they ain't gonna do anything to us. Like we can shoot it out of the sky. Japan will shoot out of the sky before it even crosses our border, so. <laughs> Jay, wasn't there also some kind of uh, talk about that? It was an actual internal problem that was actually somebody from Sony who did it and not North Korea. And fun funny enough, I also read that article, not been confirmed yet. However, for some reason, from what I'm understanding is the FBI is still confirming because I think someone was mentioning this the other day that FBI is still confirmed that it was a North Korean attack. But if it was Sony, I'm not surprised about it either because, I mean, really think about it. Uh, first of all, where are those files that when they threaten to throw uh, all of their information out when they release this video or movie, sorry, when they threaten to release this movie, where is that uh data now why is nobody in the press talking about this you know you can't tell me how of the millions of news reporters are out there and you're telling me that none of them are releasing any of the information that sony talked about hmm okay so did north korea back out or is something going on here that i should know of so yeah i see exactly what you mean by that and i'm kind of interested i feel like this is going to be like a two or three months thing from now when they make their couple million and they're like eh, yeah it was us you know <laughs> yeah i always thought it would be a really brilliant marketing campaign to to create this on your own and spread well, and this you know, is what's sad the movie itself would never have gotten that much uh press oh yeah that's what's yeah. funny if i started talking about it and trust me i don't try to endorse things when i started talking about it on a podcast Clearly, they did their job if that was what they wanted. <laughs> I did not. I felt bad because I, I, I looked at this after. I'm like, I just got suckered into talking about this so that people would watch the film. <laughs> I didn't even realize that. <laughs> but yeah, it was an interesting. I was interesting move though overall. I Sony kind of is entertaining, I guess, in a sense. And it's funny that um, there's another group of people. That uh, is called the Lizard Squad. If you don't know, they're the people that DDoS, uh, so, uh, PlayStation Network, and the Xbox Live. And also, I believe some of them did have a contribution, which were from North Korea, uh, that continued to hack for Sony. Yeah, it's basically their group is there. They call themselves the good guys because they'll go out to like major corporations and hack them not necessarily take anything special but they'll hack them to say your system's bad <laughs> which is interesting to see about that but um anyway i got a few more questions i want to ask about you guys i just, I just figured i'd get your input on that i've always been kind of curious what what someone from your industry would more or less think about something like this was it just a marketing technique whatever it would be from there but yeah it's it's definitely interesting. I, Devil's Couriers, I will leave a link in the description for their YouTube channel, of which they have Devil's Couriers on there. Um, like I said, you have Season 1 and Season 1.5 out right now. Season 2, do you know when that is launching, by the way? We'll be shooting in uh, April, March and April, and then you know a few months for editing and uh, releasing sometime after that. Okay, so you're looking okay, at about like late, late summer or something like that. Mm -hmm. right. awesome. awesome. Well... 
Make sure that everybody that's watching this, go ahead and check that out whenever it's ready to go. And uh, anyway, so let's continue on with the stories here. The stories questions. That's better. So, you have Devil's Couriers here right now. What are your intentions, other than Devil's Couriers, that you have moving on in the future ahead? Moving up and what? Moving on, like, as a group. Like, do you intend to move on as a group, break out as your own and kind of do your own kind of thing? You know, like, I'm going to direct this, I'm going to direct this, I'm going to write this. Or are you going to get together as a group and make something, like, bigger? Like, make an actual film or, you know, make a... i tell you what, Shane is the mastermind behind this whole... This Shane, whole thing. So Shane. He has, like, the, he has the 10-minute plan, the 10-week the plan, the 10-month plan, the 10-year plan... Yeah, he's got it. It's all on a on a board up here on the wall. We're we're looking at it right now. And we're gonna, <laughs> he's going to have us in ten years from now, so he can well, probably explain that. Well, don't uh, worry. Just, We've got a forty-five minute uh, podcast, so you can do whatever you want to. <laughs> uh, I, I, the plan right now is that we have season one out, and as we get ready to produce season two, before we release it, uh, we're still kind of figuring out where we want to do that. So we're actually going to take season one and season two and cut those into a feature-length film uh, that'll be between 90 and 120 minutes uh, okay. with what we have and um, release every two seasons we have, we're going to release as a film. So right now we're going to have Devil's Courier's film, mm -hmm. which would be seasons one and two, and then Devil's Courier's film two, which would be seasons three and four. And we just want to keep flipping in between uh, digital content and film content, whether that's okay. on Netflix, Hulu, or Amazon. Okay. Uh, the, the ultimate goal is to keep going back and forth. As we build a fan base digitally, we also build a film fan base that can jump back and forth and watch these little snippets oh. uh, online for free. Okay. okay. So, in so your intentions is to not only be on the YouTube industry, but you intend to branch out and kind of actually go into the actual film side of things and start getting into the bigger into the side big of things, I guess, is a good way to describe it. Describe it. Huh. Yeah, I think that you know, with the way things are now, you have these different platforms, and one of the main aspects of building an audience is through YouTube. But ultimately, you kind of want to get those big fish like Netflix, Amazon Prime, Hulu, mm -hmm. what have you. And in order to get their attention, you really have to build these fan bases. Through. Yeah, you have yeah, to have somewhere have to, have to start. I agree with you I totally. With you. Um, uh, that's why I always that's find why it funny. Always... Um, just like uh, uh, Fine like... Brothers, if you don't know, because of their elders so react to and their kids react to and all the react all the, videos that they do. I mean, they're on Nickelodeon, they're on Nickelodeon now with that show, that show, you know, and that's, you know, that's and the that's, great thing about being successful about that. It's like, well, they made it such a popular thing on the internet. They brought it to TV, but I'm interested to see what's going to be occurring five years from now between the internet and between television. What exactly is going to be the, the mix together of it ever since YouTube just became a thing, you know? I'm I, curious. I think, it's just gonna, I, I think programming is going to start to evaporate and it just turns into content and distribution mm -hmm. and people, especially with the millenniums coming up, it's, they, they don't understand how to wait one week to watch a show. Right. They want right. to watch it now. Well, I mean, that's, that's kind of the gameplay commentator's fault. <laughs> just to be fair. I mean, as I used to do that, but I didn't ever try to do it that much. A, cause it literally was an, 20 it was at least a 70 80 hour week you know and whether if you're if you upload every single day and you put a lot of effort in your videos for all the gameplay commentators that are watching this you know exactly what i'm talking about and i know you do <laughs> but for the people that do that it's you know it's like you expect something to happen every single day and then when you get the people that actually put like comedy sketches or something like that filmmaking behind it for example video game high school are you guys familiar with video game high school yes yep so same th sequence with them. You know, they take a long time to do that, and people are getting upset about it. They're like, well, why is this being so long? And then some people are so upset they got done with their third season and they're done with it forever. But I'm just, you know, it's an internet campaign. They probably don't make enough. They make enough money. I, let me say this again. They make enough money to earn back what they spent back on the overall work of it. But it's they, they're not millionaires from it, you know? <laughs> So that's the thing about the internet thing. And I, I hope that it becomes something in the future where, like, becoming on the internet it becomes even a bigger thing behind it. Now, obviously, I, people can contradict me and say, well, you know, if you have, like, 10 million subscribers and above that, you make a pretty nice penny, according to what I talked to. I mean, PewDiePie, 
I don't know how much he makes, but it's a couple million. <laughs> Everybody yeah. knows that by now. But definitely something that I'm looking forward to, hopefully in the future, is, is the integration of that. I don't know. Would you want to see that happen in the future where TV and Internet collide? Or would you rather that just they stay separated throughout the period? I think it's already happening to a degree. It's, mm. You know, I mean, the more the more independent networks that start streaming and, and having, you know, for example, HBO, you know, will have its own streaming channel. Um, ESPN is releasing one soon. I think that's sort of, it's going to become more of an on-demand yeah. type of thing. Mm -hmm. And you can get in with one of those platforms or those networks you're off to the races. I'm a, I'm our, I mean, I watch Jimmy Fallon more on online in a clip than I would, than I do at all. On true. TV. Very true. true. Very, very true. true. That's, 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 that's exactly that's what I was exactly. thinking. Speaking of that, Speaking of that, if you watch the YouTubers you watch... Rewind for 2014, has anybody got a chance to watch that? Oh, oh did you watch it? I didn't watch it yet. No. Let me what? just basically put it like this, and hopefully this isn't a spoiler for anybody that hasn't watched it. Jimmy Fallon and Conan are actually in the YouTuber Rewind video at their studio in live in front of a show. They grab this clip from, which is extremely impressive and kind of, like I said, a hint toward the combination of, you know, internet and the TV colliding, I guess you could say. But yeah, your on-demand thing, I'm like 100% behind. I agree with you so much on that, actually. I, uh, I definitely could see that happening in the future where it just all becomes on-demand. Because, I mean... You know, I'm at work, you know, in the morning. I come back in the afternoon. I, shoot, my favorite TV show is on at 10. Oh, shoot. Oh, well. You know, it's not like back in the day where, you know, you'd, you'd wait till like 7 o'clock to watch, you know, your favorite TV show. I remember I used to do that, and I felt so bad when I had basketball games. I'm like, I just missed my favorite show. <laughs> it really is hard now to watch live TV. Like, I come home, and I'm watching, like, all the seasons of American Horror Story. And I can't. You know, when I'm watching one episode, I'm like, fuck, I can't not watch the other episodes. I watch right? the other episodes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's like you and can't, you can't just stop. If you're watching something live, you're like, let me wait late so that I can just fast forward all the commercials. So <laughs> it, it, it is becoming a demand, right, to not watch live TV. It just feels like it's a drag now. Yeah. So my other question to you guys is um is your experience behind filmmaking you know did you guys go to school for it or was this something that just kind of like interested you and you just jumped on it and just learned yourself on it and just went more or less for well, everybody for if someone has like a cool story i'm more than welcome for that too <laughs> <laughs> i mean um me for example and and shane and kovar as well as actors you know we all went to college for acting um, and sort of started with that as our initial um, idea of how we were going to become successful. But it's a, largely a product of how the industry has changed over the last 10 or so years. You know, once the writer's strike happened, getting acting and jobs as a, you know, as a new developmental client or uh, actor became much more difficult. The, just the whole platform changed. Um, and it it really spurred on with the advent of, you know, YouTube and, mm -hmm. and streaming content and stuff like that. It spurred on and digital. digital, right, that you, your way in, your ticket in to at least being noticed was creating your own content. Mm -hmm. And all three of us just happened to be at a time when that was at the, the beginning. And we, we jumped on board and Winston, you know, was as well aware of that. Winston that was an award was winner and you're like oh my gosh award winner boom <laughs> bow down I need somebody who knows <laughs> how to actually do this um, you know it's interesting because I was a software engineer okay and then I uh, I hated it and my friends were dancers and I was like well I want to dance from Madonna or Madonna, but I was already too old it's not gonna happen and you're never too old to dance. And then dance. I was watching a Baka video one summer, and I really right. loved the video. And I was so frustrated because I was feeling this, like, oh, my God, that's what I want to do. I'm like, well, I can't dance for her. Well, what can I do? And I thought, well, what, what if I made the video? And not really not knowing what that meant. I had no idea. I'd never, you know, I was, I was never on set. I was never, you know, I never did any of that stuff. Um, that I actually 
one of the first people I told was Kovar. I'm like, Kovar, I think I want to produce. And Kovar's one that said, oh, well, actually, we're doing this. You want to join? I'm like, okay, let's do it. <laughs> and so that was for taking a shot. So that was actually, I think, my first time on set and my first time, uh, like, putting, you know, learning everything and putting it all together because even though as a software engineer, you're, you, you're, uh, my education was really how to put a project together. Yeah. So it was all project tasks, you know, like you mm -hmm. put a computer software, you know, program together. Now I'm putting together a movie which requires actors, crew, light equipment, blah, blah, blah. And so it, mm -hmm. it, it kind of like lent itself. I just took out movie program and I put in movie. And, uh, and then one thing led to another. And a year after that is when I did Alchemy. And then a year after that is when, at the end of Alchemy is when we made Devil's Couriers. Nice. That's but very now, nice. Within that, those two years, I went on a bunch of like productions, um, and that's how I was able to learn and produce and you know get more into it. By the time we, I got to Devil's Couriers, kind of like a full circle moment, um, I had you know I had made Alchemy already, mm -hmm. um, and I I don't know if I already submitted Alchemy, but um, those two years were that was my education. Hmm. So yeah, I have. You know, I'm still learning as I go. <laughs> I think, I think for us as actors, uh, especially the, the three of us, we're, we're in front of the camera, so you see how a lot of the things work, and, and you see the script, and you see how the director films it, and how it's edited, and the music, and you see the end product, and I think you always have a lot of, man, I'd really like to see this, or I thought this is really funny on set, and they cut that part out. Right. Or I wish they would have filmed it like this, and uh, in this scenario, I think we have an idea of how we want to do things and now we have full control of what's written how it's filmed what it looks like at the end what music goes with it i think it's much more fulfilling for us to have that that creative control to really put our stamp on it here's what we want it to look like uh, here's and also when we write i mean it's what do we want when we go on an audition you know is you get some scripts where you just shake your head all right here we go yeah and i think in this in this case, we get to say, here's what I want to work on, and we put it together, and then we get to have a final say in the end product, and uh, I guess feel fulfilled, which doesn't happen all that often as an actor. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah, I think about the I, only thing I, that you can control when you're an actor and, and, and you're trying to do the conventional route is your first audition. That's mm -hmm. about it. That's the only control you have. Once that happens, it's all up to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And so being able to be your, the creator of your own content and, and make those decisions is really empowering. And, you know, it, it spurs you on. It makes you want to do more of it and, and get better at it and, and, you know, be your own boss to a certain degree. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, when it comes to uh, filmmaking, for sure. My first thing, first, and when you're talking about, you're like, talk with the skip, uh, script writing, um, my favorite thing that I learned from experience is – my like two times that I've become an actual actor before. Like I've got an acting sense inside of me, but did I ever pull it out and say like, Hey, this is exactly what I want to do behind it in front of YouTube. Yes. In front of, uh, like a huge actual live production, not too many times, but one of my times that I did, I had to write a script with four other people. We had two, this, it was for our homecoming. I was mentioning this before earlier that basically we had two weeks with four people we had to write a script, two scripts actually, one for the introduction video we're going to do, one for the whole night of hosting, you know, our, our jokes, our, who we're putting in, et cetera, et cetera. And two weeks went by, we were stressed as can be. We got everything written down. We got everything looking great. The night before, uh, no, actually the day, the same day, but that morning, we went into the company, company. Or it's the company or it's like, to the person to the that we need to get this approved by. by they looked at they our script they thought it was garbage and told us to rewrite it that oh same day they told us to rewrite it we were in his we were we were in this office for an hour and i was telling him so many different times how this was a good joke this was a sly reference this was hilarious this part people are gonna laugh at this is not offensive at all why are you finding this ridiculous and after the end of it someone literally told me i said you say another word tim i'm pretty sure he's gonna expel you <laughs> like okay <laughs> jeez so we we had to sit down we we, we went out to this restaurant and we just sat down and just went ham on writing a script and just memorizing it like we we 
got done with our sports sports practices. And then we just went straight to it. We just like, all of us were just memorizing. And like, we were memorizing our scripts as we were eating the dinner to our homecoming. We're just like sitting with a script in our hand and we're like eating like ham. And we're just like, okay, okay. Okay. And next thing here. Oh, it was, it was pure stress. (laughs) When you have to rewrite an entire script and memorize it that night, you're just thinking to yourself, what on earth? (laughs) Sounds like a nightmare comes true. Gosh. Gosh. Luckily, our video video? turned out okay. I had to re-render it like four times because I used to have a computer that was seven years old and I had Vegas on it. And gosh, you ever want to know about the other definition of stress I had that day was I had to re-render that like four times. And it was like like three days before I was like, I got it rendered. You're like, we can't play the video on the screen. I'm like, oh, no. (laughs) This sucked. I think that the truth is, too, in, in any sort of creative venture, you're going to come across people who are going to have differences of the pain, oh, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. the, the, the good thing about what we're doing is that we'll have that same scenario. It'll just be among us. And yep. so we can actually, you know, we're all on the same level. We are able to say to each other, hey, this is a, I think this is a really good idea. I mean, this just mm-hmm. happened with, with <laughs> a, an episode that I, that I was writing where Kovar was like, I'm going to be the first to say that joke is, is out. And I was like, <laughs> I understand where you're coming from. I get you, but, you know, I think it's a really funny joke. So we talked to Shane. Shane's like, no, we can't do that joke. <laughs> well, no, it's going to happen. I love but, the joke. But at least it's, you know, it's, it's your friends. It's your, your peers that oh, are yeah. making those decisions. Exactly. And you feel more comfortable doing that. Whereas if it's some, you know, person that you really don't know, a producer or, or whomever that is – essentially the the what do you call that the stop gap that you just you know yeah. you could bang your head against the wall with ideas and if oh, they yeah. don't like them they don't like them exactly, exactly. well if you guys well, ever need an actor for devil's couriers or just need an absolute fruitcake because that would be always the fun part i've always wanted to try to play uh just make sure <laughs> make sure i just need a plane ticket and i need two nights in a hotel and that's all i need and you guys don't need to pay me anything that's there you go it's two nights one hotel <laughs> preferably one that's not bad and cost ten dollars a night that would be nice I have a really nice patio that would um, work that would work There's a couple <laughs> people board back there too you're, you're welcome to them that's all right that's we're all right. fine I, I got, I've got like, a, I'll keep a taser in my pocket or something. I don't know. We'll get creative about it. So thank you guys so much for joining today's podcast today. Again, this is the crew of Devil's Couriers. Uh, we have Winston Abolos, which Abolos, sorry, Abolos. I keep biffing your last name, <laughs> uh, who is the guy that is, uh, I'm pointing at him at my screen. Uh, he is going to be the third one over. Um, that was the main guy, but. Technically, I guess Shane's the main guy now that I understand this and familiarize it more. But check out Devil's Carriers on YouTube, guys, and obviously be checking out for their film after the season two. And give these guys a check for sure. And send me the link to Alchemy. I want to watch this really badly, and I will put that in the link in the description for everybody else to watch it too. So thank you guys so much for joining today. And I'm, and I'm Jay. You're welcome. Thank you, guys. And I'm Jay, wishing you a wonderful day.